I can see that I'm being uh, recorded, so I think I can start. Um, thank you very much for um, all of your attendance today. I can see that we have uh, quite a lot of people uh, attending, so uh, thank you very much for coming. You can see it's uh, my, my topic is looking you right in the face, the European Union-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Uh, this is exactly what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'll give you just a very... Uh, broad description of what this treaty is. Uh, second thing we'll do is talk about the legal and practical significance of the treaty. Third thing, um, I want to cover a little bit of the background of the treaty making process, because as we'll find out, uh, the treaty is uh, is in the in-between <laughs> stage right now. It, 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 we have an in-principle agreement, but it's not ratified. Um, Steps for ratification is the next logical thing to speak about. Um, an overview of the substantive provisions. Um, I'm sorry about the um, sorry about the ambulance out there, but that's one of the the joys of working at the Max Planck Institute. Um, six, just a couple of textual innovations, some new interesting um, provisions that we see in there, and finally, I want to um, mark out a couple of future issues that I'm quite interested in. It looks like a lot to get through, but honestly, I'll only spend a couple of minutes on each topic. So we will finish in good time. And if you have any questions, then you will be very welcome to ask them. So description of this document, the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Um, when we, when we talk about an agreement on investment, it, it's a document that lays down rules on how China, on the one hand, can treat European investments in China, and on the other hand, how the European Union and its member states can treat Chinese investments in the European Union. So basically a treaty regulating how states treat slash regulate the investments of well, belonging to investments of the other contracting states. So that's fairly normal. Um, some of you will, will know what an investment treaty is, and that looks like a fairly usual investment treaty in that way. Um, however, the next word I want to, to focus on will show you that it's not one of your normal investment treaties. It is called the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Um, however, as the EU now readily admits, it's, it's not that comprehensive because most investment treaties um, are focused on investment protection. So the idea is that they will give special protections, special treaty-based um, protections to investments that have been established in a host country. This treaty is different. It mostly focuses on investment liberalization. Um, investment liberalization is not about you know, rules on such as expropriation or fair and equitable treatment, these kind of core rules of usual investment treaties. Investment liberalization is all about creating rules to let investments from Europe, for example, flow more easily into the Chinese market. And that's one of the, the key things that you, you must understand about this treaty. It's not your normal investment treaty where you find a rule on expropriation, uh, where you find a rule on free transfer of capital. You won't find that in the treaty, but you will find a lot of interesting provisions trying to make investment creation between China and the EU easier in the future. Two factors are going to explain this. Uh, first one is this, between all EU member states and China, with the exception of Ireland, there are already normal investment treaties with rules such as expropriation in there. So I, I suppose that I think the, uh, the negotiators shrug their shoulders and thought, uh, okay, well, we've already got a lot of investment protection already between the EU and China. We can probably drop that part and just focused on investment liberalization. And then this leads to the second factor. Um, one of the complaints from European investors over the past decade is we cannot get access to the Chinese market. Chinese investors can come over to Europe and invest freely. That's, that's the general 
But that's the general rule in Europe. Europe welcomes foreign investments. China, however, doesn't. And that's when, when, when the negotiators talk about levelling the playing field, that's what they're talking about here. This treaty is designed to give European investors access to the Chinese market. Why is, well, what's the significance of, of all that? Um, well, let, let me rephrase. I want to go through a couple of factors which explain why it is so significant that China and the EU have come to this agreement. First one is the value of the investments covered. So what I'm talking about here is how much European investment is there in China? According to the figures that I saw today, 200 billion. Um, those investments now are subject to this new treaty. Equally, Chinese investment in Europe is subject to this treaty. So how European states go about the, the process of treating or regulating 70 billion euros worth of Chinese investment in Europe is now regulated by this treaty. Just to give you some comparisons, um, like this is a fairly broad ranging treaty, but it's, it's not the biggest that the EU has concluded. The, the biggest one is the, still the CETA agreement, the agreement between uh, Canada and the European Union. That covers 600 billion euros worth of investment. But because, of course, we are living in the, the Chinese century and, and China's economic significance is only going to grow, we can expect that this number, Chinese investment in Europe, will continue to increase in the years, uh, well, in future years. Um, second point there, I've briefly covered that. There are a whole heap of investment treaties between China and the European Union member states already. Eventually, this agreement that I'm talking about now is going to replace all of those old investment treaties, which you must be scratching your head. There is a complication here because remember I said this current treaty we're talking about, the China EU New Deal, this is all about investment liberalization. The old treaties are all about investment protection. However, in the New Deal towards the end, there is a provision where China and the EU say, we know that this agreement doesn't cover investment protection, but we want it to. And over the next two years, watch us as we negotiate a new investment treaty on investment protection, and it will wipe away all of those old treaties. So that's really the, the legal significance. Um, and in terms, I think, of broader economic, political significance, this is going to be the main, the, the document that defines economic relations as regards foreign investment between China and the EU, um, perhaps for many decades to come. However, there is a, um, I, I, I have to uh, put a little note there and say, perhaps we'll, we'll talk about why uh, later you might know the reason why yourself. Um, just to quickly cover the, the background, because I think it's an interesting story. The agreement to, to start negotiating um, for the conclusion of, of this treaty starts in February 2012. There's an agreement to launch negotiations. The first round of negotiations takes place in January 2014. From January 2014 until December 2020, there is a huge 35 rounds of negotiations to get to this um, document that we have now. It's about 70 pages long. But to give you some, um, some reference point to understand how well, how long and how complex the process has been, um, there's a similar investment treaty that the EU has negotiated with Mexico, it took them seven rounds to get to where they, where they concluded the, the treaty. So this one has been the, the subject of some 
Some tough negotiations, however, uh, finally in December 2020, just before the new year came in, um, China and the European Union released an in-principle agreement. Um, of course, that does not mean it's a concluded treaty, but it, it, it basically indicates this is the document that we've agreed on. Um, over the next year, it's going to go through some so-called legal scrubbing just to make it a little bit more um, beautiful. And uh, it will be translated into all the official languages of the European Union. And then we might see some ratification, which brings me to the next topic. What are the steps for ratification? Well, if you're sitting in the Chinese chair, um, first step is approval from the standing committee of the National People's Congress. And then that approval should be followed by the president. That's apparently only a symbolic matter. As regards the European Union, you need approval from the Council of the European Union. And finally, you need the consent of the European Parliament, which I'm sure some of you are looking at um, with your knowledge of the news of last week, thinking, well, um, that last step there <laughs> might not be happening but we can talk about that uh, perhaps in the comments and i'll also mention something about it towards the end um, an overview of some of these substantive provisions um, when i talk about substantive provisions i'm not going to to talk about the you know, what's in the definition section or what's in the final provision section um, i'm going to talk about the the core of the agreement i'm not going to go through it in much detail as you've heard the the main section section two is about investment liberalization and as I've already explained, there are a whole heap of provisions on the establishment of investments in there, trying to make sure basically that European investors can go over to China and, and start investing in the Chinese market the way Chinese investors can do in Europe. Um, if you're thinking to yourself, well, can you give me some specifics on this? I don't want to get bogged down in this, but I think one of the most interesting ones concerns forced technology transfers. You've probably heard about this issue. You have uh, European investors, for example, they wish to, to enter China, but in order to get there, they need to enter into, for example, a joint venture with a Chinese company. And as part of the joint venture agreement, the European company has to transfer some of its technology over to a future potential Chinese competitor. Of course, that's always been um, looked upon by European investors as, as simply unfair. And now there are provisions in this agreement that are trying to stop that, um, it's trying to stop um, forced technology transfers. Section three is so-called regulatory framework. I look at that now and I realize it gives absolutely nothing away as regards its content. Um, looking through it, basically what it tries to do is to make governmental processes with regard to the regulation of investments more transparent. I'm going to give an example a little bit later, but just to, as an add-on, um, there are some possibilities now for European companies, for example, to apply to participate in so-called standard setting. Um, so when a, when a Chinese government uh, authority wants to make new rules on the running of or the operation of a particular investment, uh, EU investors have the possibility now to come in and say, well, we want to have our voice heard on the drafting of these new regulations. Uh, the next part, investment and sustainable development, that's the uh, fourth part of the agreement. There are provisions on corporate social responsibility. However, none of them are hard legal obligations. Um, there are interesting provisions on the environment, particularly one provision, where each party or each contracting state to the treaty agrees, yes, we will implement the Paris Agreement. Um, there are also some provisions on labour in there. I'm going to cover one of those and show you it in a little bit of detail soon. And then finally, um, all of the provisions in this treaty are subject to state-to-state -to -state dispute settlement, which is quite unusual. 
for investment treaties. As some of you might know, one of the distinctive features of investment treaties is to give the possibility to investors to make a claim against the state, not in this treaty. In this treaty, if there is a, a dispute relating to one of the provisions, it will be an EU member state or the EU itself making a claim against China, or of course, China making a claim against the EU member state or the EU. So state to state dispute settlement is uh, one of the features of the agreement, not investor state dispute settlement. Uh, I want to cover three, I've called them textual innovations in the treaty. The first one concerns the behavior of state-owned enterprises. Can I ask you to feast your eyes on this very much reduced provision here? Each party shall ensure that its state-owned enterprises, when engaging in commercial activities, act in accordance with commercial considerations. Act in accordance with commercial considerations. And if you're wondering, well, what's kind of the significance of this? I thought I'd give the example from the port of Piraeus. Uh, as some of you might know, the port of Piraeus is now majority owned by a Chinese state owned enterprise. I've been following the situation in Piraeus with some interest for a while now. And one of the complaints that we are starting to hear from Greek ship owners is this. We have a situation where Chinese vessels come up through the Suez Canal, land in Piraeus, and then that's a, a, like, it's a transport hub for then future relay onto other European ports. So you have Chinese ships coming into Piraeus, and when they get there, you might think, oh, well, perhaps Greek ship owners could have the possibility of taking this cargo to other European ports. And what they're complaining about is this, no, a lot of that business is going over to Chinese ship owners and we are missing out. And we think as Greek ship owners, we are being unfairly excluded. Um, these, these companies are not acting in accordance with commercial considerations. They only have national interests in mind. So that's the significance of, of, these, um, of some of these provisions on the behavior of state-owned enterprises. You won't find them in any other investment treaty. They're very interesting. Something else, <laughs> pardon me, that you will not find in other investment treaties are rules on transparency of subsidies. Just excuse me, the, <coughs> the air gets a little uh, dry in here at times, sorry. So each party shall ensure transparency as regards subsidies to the following service sectors. Um, there's a whole heap of them. I haven't bothered to list them. <coughs> uh, however, I have a couple of comments on this. First one, unfortunately, um, this is not subject to dispute settlement. It's basically subject to a special consultancy uh, process where if the European Union or one of its member states thinks that China is not being fully transparent with its subsidies, then it brings that matter to the Chinese attention. And then they go through a consultation process. And of course, it's the same if, if China has an issue as regards to transparency of European subsidies, they can bring that to the attention of the relevant European Union member state. Uh, so it, it's an interesting provision. Um, it's, it's ultimately aimed at trying to make sure that Chinese state-owned companies don't compete against European companies with a special advantage, namely a, a subsidy, but it's fairly weak because it's not subject to dispute settlement. And I always see, I think with obligations such as this, there's always going to be problems of proof. How exactly do you know that Chinese, uh, well, well, European or, or Chinese um, states are not being transparent as regards their, their subsidies? Of course, it's, it's, it's a secret matter. Um, so I'm not sure how effective it really is, but at least it is in there. <laughs> Finally, I want to have a look at um, one of the provisions on labor issues. 
Here it is here. It's a little bit longer than the rest. You'll excuse me for reading it out. Each party is committed to effectively implement the ILO conventions it has ratified <clears throat> and work towards the ratification of the ILO fundamental conventions. Uh, this was the one where there was a bit of um, to and fro across the negotiating table because there was apparently some Chinese resistance to this. Again, it's not subject to dispute settlement. So it's not the strongest obligation in the treaty. The other big issue is what does it mean to say that a party is committed to something? Um, you know, I really think that's just a statement of fact. You would say, well, I'm committed to, I don't know, presenting at the Chefachentenbeschreckung um, on the 10th of May. Um, does that create a legal obligation for me to do that? No, I tend to think it's more a statement of investment. So um, it'll be interesting. I think that's an area where some more research can be done on, on the meaning of these legal operators, these um, normally you'd see the word each party shall effectively implement is committed to, of course, is uh, well, three words which we, we really don't know the meaning of. So um, if you can shed any light on the matter, it would be interesting to hear. Um, just a couple of future issues and then I'm going to finish up. Um, I think I've kept on time, although, of course, it's, it's always uh, difficult when you're talking to to understand how much time you have really taken. Um, I suppose the big issue in light of recent events is what is the potential for ratification? Um, and I, I have to say it, it is a political issue. I'm not a political scientist, so I don't want to give the impression that I can give you a, a, an answer on this that's going to really satisfy you. I think the only thing we, we can say now is that uh, the agreement does look to be in, in some danger, but perhaps things might change. Within the European Parliament, it seems that there is a, um, there's a, a feeling amongst the members there that they will not consent to it. But outside the European Parliament, I saw Angela Merkel, for example, last week was still promoting it. So there is still, I think, a lot of life in this beast. Um, I'm not... Ultimately, however, too concerned about this political issue because I, I think what's more important about this investment treaty is that it really lays down a position for the European Union as regards its future investment treaty program. Um, investment treaties since 1959 with the Germany-Pakistan investment treaty have just been about investment protection. The basic idea was this, once a state let a foreign investor come into its territory and establish the investment, then they had to abide by all of these rules. And the European Union now is saying, no, we, we need more than that. We want market access. That's one thing we want. We want European investors to have the possibility to go to other countries set up there with ease. Second thing we want is this, once they do get there, we expect fair competition between all investment, sorry, all investors in that market. So you can't invite, for example, European investors into a market and then have local investors working with the benefit of subsidies. We're not going to accept that anymore. And we've got another, a fourth principle that's starting to come into our investment treaties, sustainable development. And we, we spoke about that a little bit earlier. Um, corporate social responsibility, environmental issues, labor issues. And some of you will say, well, yeah, but actually we've already seen those in investment treaties. And yes, um, you have. The difference is, is that in the American investment treaties, for example, they, they were just there for decoration. Um, the European Union has made these obligations, for example, with respect to implementing the, the Paris Agreement, they've made them hard obligations. So they're really making them, giving them legal meaning. Um, the final thing is, this is a bit of a speculative point, 
I'm thinking about the relationship between existing investment treaties between EU member states and China and the new deal we have between the European Union and China. As I mentioned, the old investment treaties have investor state dispute settlement. The new one does not yet. It might have in the future, we'll, we'll ultimately see. My question is, when the EU and China have come together and created the new deal, can investors say the old investment treaties have somehow been superseded and we can use the new treaty to interpret the old one and take new interesting legal actions under the old treaties. My feeling is probably not, but I thought I'd raise the point anyway, because I think it's, it's rather interesting. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening and putting up with the ambulance at the beginning.